Fox Sports. Royals baseball comes to you from Kansas City, where the Royals are home after a tough road trip. They'll be greeted tonight by the Heat and the Cleveland Indians. And the Royals were players before the first trading deadline. Jonathan Broxson, who had 23 saves for the Royals, he goes to the Cincinnati Reds with the Royals receiving two minor league pitchers in return. Joe Goldberg will have more on that in just a moment. Hi, everyone. Along with Rex Hudler, I'm Ryan Lefevre. The Royals were 1-6 in six on the West Coast, but there was some good news. Billy Butler was named the American League Player of the Week. Oh, and congratulations to Billy Butler. Hope we see that again and he can duplicate it. But never gets old watching a professional hitter like Billy Butler. He started off the magical hitting with that home run off a of Weaver. 10 for 17 in his last five games. He told me that he hasn't changed his philosophy a bit. He's just been seeing more pitches to hit. And that's exactly what you want a hitter to do. Drive it to the gaps and out of the yard just like he's done. Billy and the Royals will face Derek Lowe. It'll be the third start for Lowe against the Royals this year. And the third start for Luke Hochaver against the Indians. Back to the ballpark right after this. Royals baseball is brought to you by the Missouri Lottery. When you play, students win. And by your Kansas City Chevy dealers, the official vehicle of the Kansas City Royals. And when we come back, Joel Goldberg has more on the trade of Jonathan Broxton. I dropped this.
Victoria went down for the year in spring training. Jonathan Broxton stepped in, 23 saves, 2.27 ERA, and now a Cincinnati Red. Dayton Moore trading Broxton this afternoon at the deadline. In exchange, he gets a pair of pitchers in the minor leagues. Double-A right-handed starter J.C. Sulberon, a former high school teammate of Eric Cosmers, and triple-A left-handed reliever with good numbers, Donnie Joseph. We get two pitchers that we like a great deal. They're at the upper levels, is which you know we targeted um, close to ready major league pitching as we possibly could, and it was the deal that made the most sense and that put us in the best position to move forward. And they will move forward, Ned Yost said, with Greg Holland as the closer. First pitch from Lou Kochaver is coming up against the Indians next. Tonight's game is brought to you in high definition by Time Warner Cable, the official TV, internet, and home phone provider of the Kansas City Royals. So the Royals are home for six, hoping it will be home sweet home after a one and six road trip to the West Coast. And here's the Cleveland Indians lineup. They've had their problems in the second half. They're just six and 11 and batting just 229 as a team, but their lineup begins with Shin Su Chu. Who has a 356 batting average in his career at Kauffman Stadium. And for the third time this year, the Royals will be sending Luke Hochaver to the mound against the Indians. And here's the key report. Okay, I say don't give in early. Last time he faced Cleveland, he gave up seven runs in the first inning. Chew up Chew. Chew's hitting 600 off of Hochaver. Get him back on track. Hochaver is the one who stopped that 12 game losing streak early in the season. Now he needs to stop another one. And to add to that Rex the Royals. The last. Four losing streaks. That the Royals have had of seven games or more. Luke Hochaber. Has ended that losing streak four times. Well, you know that, that's what you're looking for and basically a number one starter. That's what you ask for to to keep continue streaks that are on the good side and the ones that aren't so good you stop them. And he can do that if he executes his above average fastball on the corners. A mid 90s at tops, he'll go down at 92, sink it a little bit. Also, slider curve and a change. He's got all four. I like to focus on the three mainly. Fastball curve and change is what Dave Island would like to see him continue to focus on. Two balls, two strikes. Luke going with the curveball, and that was the. Uh, Troublesome pitch for him 
and his loss on Wednesday at the Angels. And after the game, Luke talked a lot about not having his normal bite on that pitch. And there's a curve, and that struck out Shin Su Chu, and a good beginning to the game for Ho Chaver. Royals defensively tonight presented by Ford. In order to get out of this little funk they've been in, they got to be airtight out there. Gerard Dyson and Lorenzo Cain are splitting time out there now with Frank Coors' second game on the pine. Chris Getz gets a start at second base. Salvador Perez, trustworthy catcher and a very good one. Hoping he puts down the right signs for Luke. And Kane has to fight the sun in the early innings tonight out in right. Okay, let's take a look at that breaking ball there that you got Chu to swing at. That, that's a very good depth. It starts out about belt high and fools a hitter. Good drop to it. One and one on Asdrubal Cabrera. Last time the Royals faced the Indians, they took two out of three from Cleveland. And that was in Cleveland two months ago. It's been a long time since the Royals have seen the Indians. And in that series, as Drupal Cabrera was out of the lineup with a sore hamstring, Carlos Santana was on the disabled list because of a concussion, and Travis Hafner was out because of knee surgery. So Manny Acta's starting lineup was very thin in that series, and now he has all three of those hitters back. Two and two. Cabrera's eight for 23 in his last six games. Sprays the ball all over the place. Pull for power. Back to back strikeouts. That time Ho Chaver going with a fastball that was cutting in on Cabrera. Two down. Okay, Hoach continues to get ahead. That's going to be the key for him. Stay ahead of these hitters and then execute him on his pitch. And this one was a slider. Previous one, he struck two out was a big curveball. So going to his secondary pitches early. And now Jason Kipnis, who has taken over as the Indians' number three hitter. That makes sense to the Royals as Kipnis has seven RBIs against KC this year. Oh and two. Royals enjoyed great weather on the West Coast last week. I don't think it got above 80 degrees and now back to 100 degrees at first pitch. We started on time at 7:10. Time and temp brought to you by the parking spot at KCI. Hosmer handles the slow roller. He goes to the bag, and a good start for Luke Hochaver. Two strikeouts and a weak ground ball to the right side.
activity before the trading deadline and trading Jonathan Broxton to the Cincinnati Reds for a couple of minor league pitchers. And that means that the Royals needed to identify a new closer and it will be Greg Holland. Here's the Royals lineup against Derek Lowe. They're facing him for the third time this year. And Derek Lowe won his first two starts against the Royals. One here at Kauffman Stadium for the Royals home opener. And then one win in Cleveland. Okay. He is a sinker baller deluxe. He pounds the ground with ground ball outs. He leads the major leagues with 264 ground ball outs. So look up. Don't look down. That's where he's looking. Sinker, slider, curve and a change. He'll cut his fastball a little bit, but you see the, the action on that pitch there. Everything moving down. And he challenges hitters. He's lost his last three starts. And that adds up to a 9.6 ERA in his last three starts. So the sinker and then the changeup. Two pitches very similar in action as the ball goes away from Gordon, the lefty. But the changeup's a lot slower, more deceptive. Broken bat. Tough play, Cabrera, and he loses the handle. And Alex is safe to begin the game. Cleveland Indians have the third best fielding team in the AL percentage wise sponsored by Ford. Estrubo Cabrera he's got 12 bears now Kipnis only has three so they've been pretty tight around that infield. Hotchman's a good fielding first baseman. So he's going to pick everything over there. But it's been a good fielding year for them so far. Escobar swinging at the first pitch. Coming off a good series against Seattle. Five hits and four RBIs. Staying above 300 at 305. And against Derek Lowe, four for eight. Look at that hole right there. He's wanting to go there. He's been bunting quite a bit. He's going to test Hanahan, who's a very good defensive third baseman, and he gets Escobar. And Alex moves up to second base. Yeah, he took a shot for a swing for that hole. And it's a good attempt. The ball's elevated a little. Anybody get that runner into scoring position would just would suit Ned just fine. Good technician with the bat. He can do that. Bunts to first or second base. When you're facing a sinker baller, ball going down, it's a lot easier to get that ball down when you hit the top half of it. So he helps you out in a way. And now Lorenzo Cain, who is facing Derek Lowe for the first time on the disabled list the first two times. The Royals faced Derek Lowe this year. And Lorenzo had a tough time in the Seattle series, just one for 14, and dropping his average down to 260. And up the middle off the end of the bat. Alex will be waved around third and Michael Brantley will play it to second base. So Lorenzo Kane is back on track and the Royals have a one nothing lead. Kane always aggressive early in the count with the runner in scoring position and that's a, that's huge and facing a guy like Lowe makes it a little easier to hit. You know what's coming pretty much Lowe's not afraid to pitch to contact. So Kane takes it right back where it came from biggest hole on the diamond get him on board first that's big that ups that mark of hitting in with runners in scoring position to 333 for Lorenzo and that's the first pitch out of the strike zone from Derek Lowe after seven straight strikes and you could understand if he'll pitch Billy Butler carefully Billy on the trip hit 458 against the Angels and the Mariners with a home run, six RBIs, five walks, and he was named the American League Player of the Week for the fourth time in his career. He said, I'm not changing anything. I, I've been getting some really good balls to hit. 
And also he said that facing King Felix and whenever you face an ace of a guy of a squad and then you, you have some success everyone else doesn't look quite as sharp because that's how the movement that uh, King Felix had on his pitches. This makes it easier facing other guys. Hit hard. Deep center field. Brantley is back. And he made the play up against the padding. Kane had gone all the way to second base, so he had to scurry back to the bag. Two down. Great play by Michael Brantley in center field for the second out. I'll say, I thought that ball had a chance. Good timing on the lead. Saw it all the way in his glove. Shadow in the background. What a beautiful catch. Unfortunately for Billy. Kane has a hustle back. The wind is blowing in from right so that may have hurt. Billy just enough on a hot day with the ball carrying and. Billy didn't look too surprised that that ball was caught so maybe and the hitter normally knows by the quality of the contact. And then there's a bit of a crosswind. Enough for. Brantley to catch up to it. Good to see Mike Moustakis back in there after injuring his knee his right knee in the game on Saturday he came out early. Was out Sunday and then the off day yesterday. And he pops out to Jack Hanahan. The inning is over. Lorenzo Kane drives in his 16th run, getting Gordon to the plate and giving the Royals a 1 0 lead. Royals and Indians game one of three and the Texas Rangers are in town over the weekend and in game one on Friday it is retro night. We're going to turn back the clock and the first 20,000 fans receive a Mr. Royal retro lunchbox presented by Fox Sports Kansas City Friday night at 710 the Royals and the Texas Rangers. Good start for the Royals a one nothing lead and look coach Shaver. At the Indians in order with a couple of strikeouts and a ground out. Lorenzo Kane drove in the run in the bottom of the first. And now Michael Brantley gets the Indians first base hit and he took an extra base hit away from Billy Butler in the bottom of the first. Indians have the leadoff man on. Indians have three. Guys that have double digits and stolen bases. Brantley's got 11. Shoe two has got 11 and Kipnis has 21. We'll see what Manny Acta wants to do. See if he wants to move the runners here or let Santana swing away. Brantley having some difficulty over there at first. There's the part of the stadium. 
where the sun shines through in the upper deck. Yeah, you can see it. It's right. It's right there. It's a, uh, right where he gets his lead. He's in. He's trying to duck out of the way of that. It's uncomfortable. <laughs> he can't see Hoach. <laughs> It'll only be that way for a few more minutes. There it is. So the sun will hide behind the stadium, but then it comes through those aisles where the fans go behind the stands to the concession stands. Could try time to try a pickoff. Carlos Santana now batting fifth for the Indians. It's been a struggle for him most of the year, and Manny Acta had stuck with him as the cleanup hitter. Adding just 233, and that's a well hit ball toward the right field corner. Kane cuts it off. Santana is still going to try for second, and the throw is just a little late, and Cleveland has runners at second and third with nobody out. Okay, Santana with his 19th double got him a pitch out over the middle of the plate. Good job by Kane hustling to get to that ball. Didn't think he had a shot, but after he threw it, made it close. See if what Ned does. Looks like Getz is going to be the second base. Going to be out in shallow right. On Travis Hafner, the DH, and another hitter who's batting just 233 with 10 home runs. And one of those home runs was hit here back in April. 456 feet to right field, the 10th longest home run in Kauffman Stadium history. April 15th. A breaking ball by Mendoza. Into rivals. Ooh. Hope we don't see that here. Good off speed pitch first by Luke. Of course, if you're going to throw a breaking ball, don't, don't leave it up. That's what he hit off Mendoza. Down, no balls, two strikes, and Luke is going with a couple of. Off speed breaking balls to Hafner. Look in his first start against the Indians. It was the Royals home opener, one he would like to forget. And the Indians in that game scored seven earned runs. All of those came in the first inning, and Luke actually finishes outing, retiring 10 of the last 12. Santana hit him on the left ankle to knock him out, and then Luke bounced back in Cleveland on April 25th, getting the win. And allowed just two earned runs in six and a third. Yeah, remember that. That was a tough time for the Royals. Dealing with some losses here at the K, ten in a row here to start the season wasn't easy. But then when they got onto Cleveland, he he got them in the win column. He does that by mixing up his pitches and throwing strikes. To keep it down, and usually when runners get in scoring position, that's when he does his good work. 243 is all the Cleveland Indians are hitting with runners in scoring position. One and two. You don't normally see Hafner batting sixth. He's more of a four or five guy. Still a run producing spot. Two balls, two strikes. He's had all kinds of injury problems. It all began with a, a bad right shoulder. And this year he was out for a while. He had surgery on his right knee. He's been on the disabled list six times since 2008. Travis Hafner back in 2006. And all of a sudden, that's six years ago. He had 42 home runs, 117 RBIs the year before that, 33 home runs. 
108. The year before that, 28 home runs, 109. O'Chaver gets his third strikeout and it comes at a good time with runners at second and third and nobody out. Got him on all off speed pitches and surprised after swung at that one. It was pretty well buried in the dirt. Must have been looking in and just fooled him, surprised him. So second and third one out to former Royal Johnny Damon. And he pulls it on the ground to Hosmer. O'Chaver late to the bag. No play. So the Indians tie the game on a ground ball with no out recorded. Okay, Chris Getz needs to call off Hosmer on that. Getz had that easy. If Hosmer stays home, it's a routine out. Hosmer is used to taking almost everything, especially with Uni playing second base. His range isn't that good, but you can see Hoach stopped. He just stopped. Now, see, look where Getz coming into your screen. Getz had that easily. And this makes it a more difficult play. And of course, Hosmer wasn't expecting Hoach to stop on his way to first. He hesitated two or three times. I think he was confused uh, a little bit by Hosmer taking the ball as well. Damon gets a base hit and an RBI. Now first and third. And Casey Kochman. Cleveland Indians, we were talking about their problems at the plate in the second half, and there's a big drop off once you get to their number five hitter down to the bottom of the order as far as batting average goes. Nobody has a higher average than 235. And Kochman is. At 226, he does not run well, so Royals with an excellent chance to turn a double play if he puts the ball on the ground. It would be his team leading 14th. Two and one. Well, you know, they gave him a base hit on that, but I'm going to say that that was almost a mental miscue. Would you say that? Yeah. Because ha Hosmer needs to know that Getz was playing Damon to, to pull a little bit, so he was already over in that hole, and he had it covered. All he had to do, ha Hosmer, was just go to the base. They would have had it out. Now Damon runs and Kochman bloops it into right field to give Cleveland the lead and Damon will keep going to third base. So Kochman who had been 0 for 12. Picks up his 39th RBI and the Indians have two runs four hits. In the second inning after being knocked down in order in the first. Okay a little run and hit actor wanted to stay out of the double play so he sends Damon and Kochman. It's a jam shot, but that's all he was trying to do, pull it in that hole. And after the meeting, O'Chaver is going to get number nine hitter Jack Hanahan. And hands another Cleveland Indian who spent some time on the disabled list this year with a calf injury at the end of May. Cleveland season very similar to last year where they got off to a good start and then tailed off. They come into tonight 50 and 52 two games below 500 they haven't been. Two games below 500 since they were two and four to begin the year, and they've been as high as eight games above 500 this season, and they've had as much as high as a four-game lead in the American League Central. Yeah, and you know after this weekend series against Minnesota, where they were swept, they got outscored 28 to six. So their dobber's a little down. Royals want to keep it, keep theirs. Keep him down if you can. We're running into some trouble here. 
And a three pitch strikeout. Hochaver has four strikeouts in less than two innings. Down 2 1 in the second. Okay, getting the majority of them with his breaking balls. Fooling Cleveland hit hitters and keeping them off balance. And that's kind of been, it seems, the make or break pitch for him when he is, since he's altered his approach and just going with his core pitches, four seam fastball, curveball change. He's still throwing the other pitches, just not with the same frequency, but it seems since then transition. However, his curveball goes, so goes Luke Hochaver. All right, and the changeup's a pitch that he uses effectively against lefties when it's working. Starts it out over the middle and it fades away. Gets guys to pop it up or pull, pull it on the ground. One ball, one strike, and I'm sure in the Royals' minds now, this is bonus time for the Indians if they had handled the ground ball and turned it into an out, but Cleveland still hitting with first and third and Shin Su Chu at the plate. Ochaver struck him out with that curveball to open the game. Two balls and one strike. Shin Su Chu is driven in seven runs against the Royals this year. Two and two. That was a good start for Hochaver to strike out Shin Su Chu because prior to that, Shin Su Chu was a 600 career hitter with 25 at bats, three of those 15 hits being home runs. Just to get him here. That was the pitch he used to strike him out in the first. Last time the Indians were here, Jonathan Sanchez hit Shin Su Chu. And then Jen Mar Gomez hit Mike Moustakis, and the bench is cleared. And the last time Luke Hochaver pitched, he was ejected after nailing the Angels' Mike Trout. On a pitch that hit his bat. Bob Davis saw it coming, the umpire, and he said, you know what? You're, you were throwing at him. You're out. So he threw him out before he even saw the pitch and where the ball went. And essentially saying it's okay for your guy to get hit twice. Lorenzo Kane by Jared Weaver. But no, 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 no. You can't hit one of their guys. Hochaver tonight has struck out two twice. He has five strikeouts, but the Indians get two runs in the second to take the lead.
That's Bob Heidenberg having a good time tonight, involved with youth baseball for over 38 years in Johnson County, Kansas, working as an umpire and umpire supervisor at Johnson County 3 and 2. In 2010, he retired from his umpiring duties, but he still works the ticket game at Johnson County 3 and 2 ballpark two nights a week and every weekend during the season. He is 83 years young and lives in Overland Park, Kansas. Enjoying the game tonight in the Buck O'Neill Legacy seat. As the Royals got a run in the bottom of the first against Derek Lowe, and then the Indians back with two in the second against Luke Hochaver. Salvador Perez, Eric Hosmer, and Chris Getz coming up in the second. Shin Su Chu brings it down in right field, one down. And now Derek Lowe will face Eric Hosmer. And as you enjoy a cold one tonight, on another hot night in Kansas City, we invite you to look forward to Miller time later in tonight's game, brought to you by Miller Lite. to Eric Hosmer just three out of 14 in the just completed Seattle series but he had a big hit on Sunday afternoon in game four as the Royals came back late from a 5 2 deficit they got three runs in the eighth and Derek Lowe nice play somehow an underhand flip around Hosmer for the out you know he's athletic for sure Hosmer almost beat that out. Trying to pull a pitch that was up and away. That's usually the result. But look at that. Oh, man. I thought a little hang time on that flip. And he just got it. All one to Chris Getz. You mentioned the Royals trying to make Derek Lowe elevate the ball, stay away from the ground balls. He has two ground ball outs. One of them was a sacrifice bunt. All the other outs have been in the air. You know, Hosmer, though, early in the count like that, swinging at a pitch that's up and away, trying to pull it, that's just not a good AB. I'd like to see him have that one back. There's a bullet into center field, and Chris Getz has a two out single. Yeah, there's the one out over the plate they're looking for. That's right down the middle. Perfect stroke by Getzi. Good head position right down on that ball. Derek Lowe got off to a great start this year for the Cleveland Indians, and it looked like an excellent move for the Indians acquiring him from the Braves. He had 17 losses last year. That was the most in the major leagues. And then in his first eight starts, six and one, an ERA just over two, one of the best ERAs in the league. But since then, two and eight, and has earned our average seven and a half. That's a fair ball. Gets will go to third. He'll be held. And Dyson's at second base with a double. And that was a good call by third base coach Eddie Rodriguez. Casey Kochman first argued. And he made contact with that ball in foul territory. Yeah, he was saying it was foul, but Kotsman couldn't quite glove it here. And, he, and he's telling the umpire there, hey, look, look, it was a foul ball. But I thought that Kotsman deflected it slow enough to where he might have could have scored gets, but wasn't going to happen. Perfect throw to home. It was a one hopper right there. And they would have gotten him. So two in scoring position for Alex Gordon who led off the first with an infield single and scored on Lorenzo Cain's base hit. Okay, that's the first breaking ball in that Gordon saw. He saw three pitches his last at bat and he hit the third one. And they were all one first was a sinker, change up away. They all had the same motion middle away, so he took it that way.
This could be a big pickup here for Hochaver. If you get him a lousy single. Maybe more. You mentioned the wind blowing slightly in from right. But it's warm air. About 40% humidity today is going to help him carry. Billy Butler just missed hitting a two run home run in the bottom of the first inning. Michael Brantley made a leaping play up against the padding in center field. Ball going into the crosswind, blowing in from right. Three balls, one strike on Alex Gordon. Speaking of home runs, it's been a while for Alex. You have to go back to that leadoff home run that he hit against Zach Grinke back on June 12th. Five home runs, 37 RBIs this year. Leading the American League with 34 doubles. Now, Derek Lowe and Carlos Santana aren't on the same page as far as what they want to do, three and one. They want to give in to Alex Gordon with an open base. Or try and get Alex to hit on Lowe's terms, and if he walks, face Alcides Escobar with the bases loaded. We're about to find out. And he goes with a hard slider for ball four. So it will be low and Escobar with the bases loaded. All this started with two outs and nobody on. Gets single to center. Dyson with a high bouncing ground ball off of Kochman's glove for a double. And now the Gordon walk. Escobar tried to bunt for a base hit. He was given a sacrifice bunt, but he's trying to reach. Thrown out by a third baseman, Jack Hanahan. Escobar two for 12 with a sax full this year. 0 and 1. Chance to get a big hit on this two out rally. Through the right side, a base hit. Dice into the plate. Chu's throw is up the line, and the Royals regain the lead. Okay, this is how you play winning baseball by getting big hits when you need them, when you have to have them. If he would have made an out here, it was like going to be like, a, oh, another letdown. But no, now this lifts up everyone, the entire team. This base hit by Kochman, and Kochman was playing him way off that line over there in that hole. He almost knew he was hitting that, gonna hit the ball that way. Big swing there. And a couple runs knocked in were huge to regain the lead. So you got the crowd into it now. They're clapping. You know, it's a big hit there. And now getting into the middle of the order, Lorenzo Kane has driven in a run tonight. Single to center field with one out in the first, driving in Alex Gordon. Now Gordon's at second, Escobar's at first. Oh and two. Don't know if he's swung at a strike yet. Nope. He's aggressive. Always when with runners in scoring position, and that's a that's a good trait to have. Before his last at bat where he knocked in a run, he's hitting 333. With him loaded out there. Second and beyond. And Derek Lowe and Carlos Santana are going to chat again. So Derek Lowe, who's lost his last three starts with an ERA of almost 10 over that stretch, has given up three runs in the first two innings. And in this inning, two, after two outs and nobody on base. Two balls, two strikes. And Derek Lowe knew who's on. He knows who's on deck, so he he uh, he's going to have to come in here and, and give Kane something to hit. And 
got him with a breaking ball down and away. The Royals get two to regain the lead. The end of two, Royals three, Cleveland two. Bring the kids out for a fun-filled day of entertainment and activities. It's Royals Kids Fest coming up on Sunday against the Texas Rangers. And the first 5,000 kids through the gates receive this Royals necklace. Courtesy of your KC area Chevy dealers. Sunday afternoon, Royals and the Texas Rangers. Royals have given Luke Hochaver the lead again. As Drupal Cabrera, Jason Kipnis, and Michael Brantley coming up in the third. And Cabrera, deep center field. Dyson back to the wall, leaping. And it drops. Oh, man, he had a beat on it. He had it. Good speed got him to the right point. He checks the wall, knew exactly where he was, hit the wall before the ball got to him. That kind of jug, juggled the ball loose a little bit. See how he hits the wall first? He couldn't cradle it in after that to hit off the heel of his glove. Would have been nice. So back on the Indians with a runner at second base, nobody out. And a strike to Jason Kipnis, who's 0 for 1 and 0 for his last nine. And Kipnis gets a ground ball to the right side. That'll get Cabrera over to third, one down. And now Michael Brantley, who's already had an impact in the game tonight, both in the field and at the plate. He singled leading off the Indians second and scored. Indians got two in that inning. And in the bottom of the first, he went crashing into the wall, similar to Gerard Dyson in this inning, but hung on to a fly ball from Billy Butler. Oh and one. Perfect timing on the lead. Catch the ball, then hit the wall. Dyson, he hit the wall first, and that kind of messed him up when it came to pulling that ball down. Timing's everything out there. Those plays aren't easy. Brantley had a little bit of an advantage where that ball was hit higher, so he could slow down and then time his leap, where Dyson was still in the middle of his full sprint.
And that gets through Salvador Perez play at the plate. And Cabrera is in to tie the game at three. Salvador not happy with himself. I could tell when he turned to come back and get the ball. I could just look at the expression on his face. He normally smothers everything that, that, that's right in front of him. Just just got underneath him. It's a good try you know, on a good feed to Hochaver. I'm glad Hochaver didn't hurt himself because it looked to me like his feet got a little tangled up there. Chaver's sixth wild pitch. And a base hit up the right field line as Brantley jumped on a hanging breaking ball. So he's two for two. And he'll be at second base with one out. Yep, that starts up around his neck. Guys that know how to pick up a breaking ball, they can tell when he releases it if it's going to be hittable by the way it comes out. If it's up around your neck, it's going to be good to hit, good hitting. If it comes out around your belt, better lay off and it's going to be in the dirt. Picking up those breaking balls is essential if you're going to be a good breaking ball hitter, especially the big curve. Santana. Doubled up the right field line in the second inning. Talked about his low batting average when he hit in the second, but he does walk quite a bit. He has 60 walks, fourth in the American League, and he has now reached base with at least a hit or a walk in 22 of his last 24 games. So there's the advantage of a good eye at the plate. If he's not hitting, he's still getting on base. Hey, Jin Wong with a play. Oh, and I don't see a glove. Oh, went in high. Very nice. Somewhere. Jin, the Royals director of baseball administration. Deep center field again. Dyson at the track and makes the play in front of the wall deep enough for Brantley to tag. And he will go to third base with two down. Jin Wong played his college ball at Mary Washington, where he was a Division III All American in 1996. Still has some good fielding skills up there in the baseball operation suite. And that thing came in hot. It was. It hadn't started coming down yet. It was on the line. And very casually just sets the ball next to his computer and gets back to work. Work to be done. Luke Ochaver with soft stuff struck out Travis Hafner eventually putting him away with a curveball in the second inning. And Luke has struck out five. That's an accomplishment against the Indians. They are similar to the Royals where they are tough to strike out. The Royals have struck out the fewest of all American League teams. And then second fewest, the Cleveland Indians. A disappointing year for the Indians at the plate. They are ninth in the league in runs scored, 11th in the league in home runs. But because of the walks, they are fifth in on base percentage. They're trying to bust them inside with a fastball, two and one. Yeah, I told you that earlier they're only hitting 243 as a team with runners in scoring position, and Hafner hitting 125. That's why he's hitting down in the order. Him, Damon, and Kochman all under 200 as far as run producing goes with runners in scoring position. Ned's got the right side of his infield playing Hafner to pull. Gets is in shallow right. Two and two.
Now Hafner's game is power. But because teams are being more aggressive in their shifts. Does he spend a couple of rounds of batting practice every day working on. Line drives the other way. I mean there's only. There's only two people. Between the infield and the outfield on the entire left side. First round only to get loose. He's not going to change his approach to the way they're defending him. He's got to hit to his strength, and that's power. But even with a runner at third base and two outs, I mean, he could just hit a little ground ball over there. Or he could even just square up and drop a little bunt down. You would think in this situation he might look for a pitch out there and go there. And he does go the other way. And that drives Alex back to the front of the warning track. That ends the inning. The Indians score in the third. And we are tied at three. Billy Butler using all quadrants of the hitting field. There's a home run earlier at Cleveland Indians field there, and he goes opposite field. Like to see him stay inside of that ball with power to the opposite field. And he starts the bottom of the third, taking a strike, and he was using the middle of the field in the first inning when he flied out to deep center, and Michael Brantley made the defensive play of the game. Slamming into the padding. Billy's been as consistent a hitter as the weather has been here in the Midwest. Steady and hot. Through the left side. Back come the Royals. The Indians were scoreless in the top of the first, but everybody has scored since then. The Royals scored in the bottom of the first. Both teams scored in the second. The Indians have scored in the top of the third. Let's bring in Joel Goldberg. Well, Ryan, want to let everybody know. First off, it is a Twitter Tuesday night, so if you want to send in questions for Ryan and HUD and the group, you can send them to at FS Kansas City. Also, we've been telling you about this social media night that is going on. That is tomorrow night. We're going to have a Q&A before the game with Danny Duffy and fans can get involved in that too. You can send Twitter questions to at FS Kansas City with the hashtag social media night. As for tonight, I'll throw one at you guys for now. We'll get back to it in the fifth inning and you talked about it a little bit. And stock has to center field and Brantley runs it down. Go ahead, Joel. Well, if the Royals can get the lead here late and you talked about Greg Holland and Andrew Wood asked now that Brox is gone, who do you think will best fill his role? We've told you who will fill his role. What do you think about the choice of Broxton, guys? Or of Holland, pardon me. I think it's, it makes perfect sense. I mean, he, he, he's back into throwing his pitches, executing strong fastballs, breaking balls. He's pounding the strike zone. And I don't think there's a, a better guy they could put in there. And he was eventually going to get that shot 
somewhere. Even if Joaquin Soria was healthy, if Jonathan Broxton hadn't been traded away. I mean, with his ability, he was going to be used or auditioned as a closer. And that's not to suggest that he would have gone elsewhere and become that, but he might have been the best setup man in the American League. And he still might be if Joaquin Soria comes back, but at some point you want to know if Greg Holland has the nerve to get through the ninth inning. Three good swings for the Royals, two singles, and a line out to deep center. And Salvador Perez is one for two. I think it's good that Ned came right out and told the people who the closer was going to be. Because that leaves guys guessing out there in that bullpen. You want guys in their roles right away. And that's a good job by Ned to go ahead and announce it instead of going closer by committee. Leaves guys out there thinking. There's question marks. It's late in the season. You don't want that. You know, it was interesting back in spring training when the question was, would it be Broxton or Holland after Soria got hurt? And he ended up going with Broxton, saying he was going with the guy with experience. And then we saw Holland get off to that terrible start and then found out he had been hurt. And, you know, you have to wonder whether whether that was part of the original decision. We didn't know about the injury at that point. The nice thing at now for for Ned Yost is he has so many options because you know that Aaron Crow is a guy that could be capable and Kelvin Herrera absolutely has the kind of stuff that could translate into a closer too. I agree with you. He's got a couple a uh, few options. But the fact that Holland got hurt that got Broxton back into his old mentality of being a closer and he took off with it. And it was nice to hear him thank the Royals organization for helping him get back on track and get his career going again. You know what was interesting was watching Jonathan Broxton speak with the media before he left. Oftentimes when these moves are made, you don't locally see that player that was sent because by the time the clubhouse opens, the guy is gone and he's moved on to whatever city. But, but he was still there gathering up his things. And really sense and talking to him and some other guys that that he absolutely loved it here in Kansas City. He's a quiet guy. A funny guy too. Uh, he's got a very dry sense of humor but he's very soft spoken. Not a guy that that looks for the spotlight and obviously he gets that spotlight in the ninth inning but I really think he liked the pace around here not to mention all the Georgia and country boys in that clubhouse <laughs> where he fit in just fine with the Frank Cores and the Ho Chavers and the Hollands of the world. Here's the trade. Donnie Joseph, a reliever at AAA Louisville, 4 and 2, an ERA under 1, 13 saves. JC Subaron, who was a high school teammate of Eric Hosmer, they won a state championship in Florida and 111 strikeouts in AA. Yeah, Ryan, it was interesting listening to Hosmer give the scouting report on Subaron today. And he said that actually he's got the smooth and clean and easy delivery of a Felix Hernandez. Not saying he's going to beat Felix, but just a very easy delivery. And he said he remembers the first day they saw him at high school because he had moved in. He had come in from the island of Curacao, which is famous from a baseball standpoint of where Andrew Jones is from. And they say, here's this new kid in class. He doesn't speak any English. And then they found out, oh, this is the new pitcher that we got. And he is really good as Hosmer takes the walk. Hey, guys, how about the state championship team from Hosmer's senior year that went on to win the national championship. On that team, six guys went on either that year or in following years to be drafted in the major leagues. Hosmer, of course, was in the first round. Their catcher that year was drafted in the third round. Detroit's got a star player that was in the Futures game that went in 2010 as a supplemental first. Kid that went in the first round now as a shortstop this past year was on that team. And then Sulbaran was in the 30th round. They also had a center fielder in the 50th round. So kind of easy to understand why that school did so well. I like the fact that he's got a high ceiling as a starting pitcher. And the lefty they picked up, Donnie Joseph, overall 52 and a third innings, 170 ERA, 68 punch outs, just 14 walks. So he's a strike thrower. And reading up on the kid, Joseph, he's a competitor. They said the guy really likes to compete. And that's a that's a good makeup, especially for a back end of the road to, uh, of the bullpen guy. Had two power arms, as you mentioned, one a reliever and one a starter. Now you remember Dayton Moore had said we want to find major league ready pitching now, and they just couldn't find it. They looked, they tried, it wasn't there. 
So they went out there and found the two best kids they could find at the upper levels of the minor leagues, believe they could be part of their future. Oh, boy. Well, that's a balk. So the Royals regain the lead as Derek Lowe loses his footing. That's an easy call for the four umpires. And now he's going to do a little groundwork in front of the pitcher's rubber. Well, he, he might have had a little bit of clay on the bottom of his spikes. It didn't quite. He drug his heel and he tripped on his heel, look like. So that takes away the possibility of a ground ball and a double play. And now second and third to Chris Getz. Got a solid base hit into center field in the second inning, and that was with two outs and nobody on. The Royals turned that into a two run inning. So now the Royals have scored in all three innings against Derek Lowe. One in the first, two in the second, one in the third, and now Getz rams it into right center field to drive in two more. Manny Acta had his infielders at, at halfway, so they give him a little more range. And I was just saying that that same base hit that he hit in the first up the middle is where he wants to aim, and he did. He stayed in the large part of the field. Ball was out over the middle, and he put it in play, and he's off to the races. Another big hit. It's Escobar and Getz now with the big hit. Getz again, staying hot. It's the ball well. Two times up and low. It's got to go. Hey, don't forget every Wednesday is Inc. Student Night and Local Music Showcase. You show your valid student ID at the box office, you'll get a $7 ticket. And make sure to get here early for live local music and drink specials in the outfield experience before the game. Go to royals.com slash student night for tickets. A balk and a two-run double from Chris Getz puts the Royals in front by three. And here's a couple of teams who have struggled recently to score runs and we've seen nine now before we're out of the third inning and Derek Lowe's problems are getting worse and as he goes two and a third innings and gives up six runs eight hits and now Tomlin to Dyson Chew back in front of the warning track and that'll get Chris gets to third Dyson is one for two. Dyson. Got a good piece of that ball. Trying to drive one out of here. Tomlin's not overpowering guy. He's had some difficulties with that ERA around a little bit over five. He tries to throw the same type of pitch that Lowe did, a little sinker. Big curve ball, slider and change up. 87 to 92.
And as he has struggled, he has moved to the bullpen. This is just Tomlin's second relief appearance. He's made 16 starts, given up a ton of hits 114 hits in 95 innings, and 16 home runs. So he's trying to put the pieces back together in the bullpen. Curveball got away from him. One ball, one strike. Alex singled in the first, his team leading 119th hit, and then walked in the second, his team leading 53rd walk. Broken bat over Kochman and into right field. And Alex is going to try for two, and Chu's throw is late. 35 doubles to lead the league, and the Royals lead 7 4 in the third inning. Just keep the pedal to the metal. Score them early and often, even with two outs. It's a beautiful thing to keep that rally going. That ball, no chance Kochman had. And the minute Gordon hit it, it jammed him, and he's thinking double right out of the box. Chu would have had to make a perfect throw to get him, and really, that's a good play with two outs. I would bet that eight of Alex's last ten hits have been on a broken bat. Well, we, yeah, he's living right. Yeah, he is. We've chronicled uh, how he breaks bats, but man, I tell you, I'd say uh, more than half of them have died a hero. So he's two for two. That's his 38th RBI. And now Alex is at 293. Escobar trying to get him home. Escobar drove in two in the second inning. He's ahead in the count, two balls and no strikes. And now Escobar has driven in at least one run in each of his last three games. Thriving in that second spot in the order. Ned's found a home for his top two hitters, Gordon and Escobar. Kane's been batting third a lot. That'll work. Into the right field corner to get another run home. And Escobar wants three. He is in with an RBI triple. The Royals have a five run third inning and lead eight three. Oh, he lofted that ball in a perfect spot. Outside pitch. He knew it looked like he was going that way the whole time. Perfectly placed. And it's off to the races. Escobar running the bases hard. It's the inside part of the base. That's proper. That's his fifth triple on the season. Now strike to Lorenzo Kane, who's the ninth Royal to bat. Royals didn't score more than six runs on the road trip. And the two games they scored six runs, they lost. And now they have eight to begin a homestand as Kane pulls it on the ground to Hanahan. And that's the inning. A five run third for the Royals and a five run lead to the fourth inning.
Hey Royals fans, Danny Duffy here to tell you about Social Media Night on Wednesday, August 1st. Come out to the K and join me for a question and answer session at the Budweiser Party Deck. You can follow me at DDuffKC23 and submit your questions using the hashtag Social Media Night. Log on to Royals.com for ticket info and we'll see you at the ballpark. Blue Coach Haver with a five run lead as he begins the fourth inning. Here's Danny Duffy. Well, the Royals have really missed him. I was just looking at the numbers and we brought up how much it's hurt the Royals to have Danny Duffy and Felipe Paulino out. And with the Royals needing some help in the starting rotation, Duffy's ERA when he went down was 3.9. Paulino's was 1.67. Yep. And not to mention a year of experience that he's missed. Mm -hmm. But those things happen. And fortunately, in this modern era, you don't lose your career when you pop a ligand on your elbow like they did in the old days. They have a surgery for it. Gets with a nice play, leaping out into shallow right field. He's had a big night. That goes with two hits, two RBIs, and two runs scored at the plate. Royals came out early before the game. As you see, Getz takes four steps, takes a big leap, robs Johnny Damon. They came out early. They worked on their infield defense. I liked it. They were paying attention to that stuff early, working on double play balls. They were working on the corners. And there was a little bit of an emphasis on their infield defense to keep it sharp. One and one from Ho Chaver to Casey Kochman. He drove in a run in the Indians, two runs second. He had been 0 for 12 before that base hit. You know, I didn't hear anything about the weather today from any of the players. No one said anything about the weather. The only thing I heard was when we got off the plane the other day on Sunday night, as we got into the, the air, I heard a few guys go, whoa. Ooh. <laughs> you know, I was one of them. That was after Man. 65, 70 degree weather. And that was it. Today, it's game on. They're back to business. Well, and it's good hitting weather. It is. I'd much rather hit in this weather. Kochman walks with one out. That's Ho Chavers first. Jack Hanahan struck out in the second inning. Luke has five strikeouts to go with the one walk. You know, before games, too, out here early around three o'clock, the, the groundskeepers, grounds crews always out here and Trevor Vance, the head's groundskeeper here, we got to talking about the weather, and he said, you know, it, it wasn't humid like you guys thought it was while you were gone. It was dry, and so that sucks all the moisture out of the ground. It really keeps keeps it difficult to try to keep this grass green. He said, today's a little better. It's 40% humidity. The humidity helps keep the moisture down and in. And I said, well, how do you keep the thing so green? It's beautiful out here. He said, well, early morning, we go heavy water on this field. During the day, we kind of do light watering. So it, it takes constant maintenance to keep this grass as beautiful as it is in this weather. Trevor taught me that years ago in this heat. And this was in reference to the grass at home. You know, what do you do to try and keep your grass alive during these hot months? And that light water in the afternoon just to keep your grass cool. Don't let it get too hot. But Trevor also. <laughs> said something I never forget. He says you need to you need to treat your grass as you would your baby. And you don't want to put your baby to bed at night wet. You want to put your baby to bed at night dry. So that that overnight soaking is not what Trevor Vance does. It's that heavy soak early in the day. That's right. Early morning, heavy water. And 
And if you'd like more lawn care tips, just call 1-800-ASK-REX. And I will refer you to Trevor Vance, who's an expert on Trevor Turf. Her ball stayed up, and Hanahan got underneath it. It is carrying, and Dyson backpedaling onto the track. And that comes with no wind blowing in from right field. So if Billy Butler could have just had those conditions when he batted in the first, that looked like just a routine fly ball to center field, and Dyson was quickly running out of room. Coach has kept him in the park so far. Few of them close. And home runs have been an issue for him lately. It, for most of the season, it hasn't been an issue. He only gave up six home runs in his first 15 starts. But now home runs in his last five and seven home runs over his last five starts. So take a look at where Ho Shaver and Derek Lowe were on the radar gun, their Time Warner ultimate pitch speed comparison. Shin Su Chu had a 600 career batting average against Luke Hochaver coming into tonight. That was in 25 at bats with three home runs. But tonight he has struck out twice. And he wasn't happy getting called out looking his last time. Him and home plate umpire Tim Wilkie had, had some words. And he actually had to come out, get in between them so he didn't lose his right fielder. Shinsu Chu, similar to Alex Gordon, where the Indians have tried him in the middle of the order. He's a good hitter with some occasional power. But there was a need at the top of the order, so they moved him to the leadoff spot just to see how that would go, and he just took off. He has stayed healthy this year. He was on the disabled list twice last season and then was shut down in September. And now Luke walks him on four straight pitches to put two on with two out and two walks in the inning. Here's a look at tonight's sprint. You call it question. Which team is most improved after the first trade deadline? The Angels getting Zach Grinke from the Brewers. Texas Rangers getting Ryan Dempster, who is rumored to go to the Dodgers or the Braves, goes to Texas. Giovanni Soto, the catcher from the Cubs, going to Texas. Kevin Euclid, Francisco Liriano, Brett Myers to the White Sox, or Ichiro Suzuki or Casey McGee going to the Yankees. Next 4 3 2 4 3 2 and our keyword Royals followed by a space A B C or D your thoughts. I'm going to say that the Rangers. I think are a little bit nervous of the Angels in getting Zach Green. So starting pitcher to me. The Angels have to get. The nod. And they are up for nothing on the Rangers again tonight as they. Pounded them last night. They're, they're creeping in there. Who holds with a couple of homers in that game? And on the day that the Rangers acquire Ryan Dempster, they found out that Neftali Feliz, who was their closer and had moved to the starting rotation this year, he needs Tommy John surgery. So they weren't going to get him back. Roy Oswalt, whom they signed recently, has been shipped to the bullpen, so there was a need in the starting rotation. And to your point, how much did the Rangers give up, or how much were they willing to give up for Dempster after they saw the Angels go out and get Zach Greinke? Pressure was on him. Ochaver laboring here in the Fourth inning, the two outs were hard hit. So Tiford is warming up in the bullpen, and Cabrera pops it to right field. And Lorenzo Kane is there for the out. A scoreless fourth for Luke Hochaver. Royals have an 8 3 lead over the Indians.
Royals baseball is brought to you by your Midwest Ford dealer and by AT&T, the world's largest 4G network. AT&T, rethink possible. It is an American sports television rule that when there is a full moon, you must show it on television. And there it is. Well, that's about how the ball looks to Billy Butler. <laughs> and the rest of the lineup, the Royals yeah. have eight runs, ten hits in the first three innings. I just think the timing was perfect. Billy broke his bat. Kipnis will throw him out. Billy is one for three tonight. Josh Tomlin on the mound for Cleveland as starter Derek Lowe lasted just two and a third innings. The Royals scored seven of their eight runs off of him and then Tomlin recorded the last two outs and he allowed a run. Oil sent nine to the plate and scored five runs in the third. They have scored in each of the first three innings tonight. Mike Moustakis is fouled to third and he's lined out to deep center field. He's had a good year against the Indians. He's hit over 400 with 10 RBIs after the Indians held him to a 194 batting average last year. So it worked last year is not working this year. Yeah. You mentioned Tomlin's given up 16 home runs, 12 of them to left handed batters. Tough sky at the moment, but Cabrera finds it out in shallow center field. It's that time of night where the ball really blends in with the sky and almost have to treat a ball in the air like you're playing at the Metrodome where you can lose the ball. Up against that old Teflon roof there. You can't take your eye off it. No. 52% agree with Rex Hudler that the Angels are most improved so far after the first trade deadline. And that's just acquiring one guy, Zach Grinke. Well, sometimes a guy that's that good, you know, you could make a big statement. And, you know, that gives the the Angels a pretty solid rotation. Grinky, Weaver, CJ Wilson, Dan Heron. And that might light a fire under Irvin Santana. Tomlin gets the Royals in order in the bottom of the fourth. First time the Royals have been scoreless tonight. They have a five run lead to the fifth. Yeah, keep going. Better not cry. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Joel. No, I mean it, it's always good to hear it in, in you know 100. What was the start temperature? 101, something well, like it's, that. It's it's a little known fact, but Santa Claus is a huge Royals fan and makes at least one trip to Kauffman Stadium every season. So. I thought he was just on a ballpark yeah. tour. Sorry about that. Go ahead, Joel. Visiting all 30 <laughs> ballparks. Good to have him in the house for Twitter Tuesday. Eric Hendricks asks, should we expect any more trades? In August, 
you guys, you know that, that that trade deadline really does go through August with guys having to clear waivers and still could happen. Just a little more complicated now because, you know, the, the non-waiver trade, li- trade deadline, which is the one that expired at 3 o'clock Central Time, you go ahead and trade to your heart's content. Now a player has to clear waivers, meaning he is placed through waivers and all 30, all the other 29 teams can claim him beginning from worst record to best record. And the player, the major league player, has to clear waivers. And if they're traded for minor league players, so those minor league players don't have to go through waivers, but the, the big league players involved do have to go through waivers first. So technically another team in your own division can block the trade if they want to by claiming it. Right. And then you can pull that player back too just because they claim them doesn't mean that you have to do anything and teams are always trying to get guys through waivers and not because they want that player to be claimed and not necessarily because they want to trade that player away but if a team does claim that player and because you can pull them back well you now you know in the back of your mind hey these guys want this player there's a break for the Royals and Hochaver a shot from Brantley who's been clobbering the ball all night and that's a double play, two down. Glove save and a beauty. Hosmer in. Look at him. He stays low for a reason. It's the hot corner. Got to be ready. Coach will say thank you for being there. Right place, right time. Did you see how he watched the ball all the way into his glove? Terrific fielder. And that's a big play for that reason and Hochaver labored to get through the fourth inning. He walked two and is only two tonight. And there are a couple of hard hit outs. And then Tomlin went out and knocked the Royals down right away. And Luke had to go right back out there and gave up a base hit. And then the line drive. So that's a huge blessing for him to get the double play. Now facing Santana, one ball, one strike. Yeah, you know, he's kept his team in the game. He did give up a, a pair in the second inning and one in the third. But it's nice to see him. In- Hopefully he can at least stay in long enough to qualify for a win. That's just one more out. Here's a uh, quick, easy one, guys, and I know Monty can talk about this, but both of you have been around enough pitchers and understand how this one works. Steven Fleener, why do pitchers rub the ball before they pitch you'll see them lick their fingers a lot of times too you can talk about that where's monty well, he's upstairs just to improve right ryan, ryan how about you well you know i mean if, if their hands are wet they're gonna try and rub some of that moisture into the ball dry their hands out a little bit if their hands are dry then they're gonna go to their mouth to try and get some moisture on their fingertips for it's all about getting a better grip even though the ball has had some Delaware mud rubbed on it before the game. Sometimes by the time they get, the umpires get it and the act pitcher, pitcher actually gets it, it's slick. So each ball they get, it has a different feel to it. And early in the season, you're more likely to see guys trying to get their fingers a little bit more wet to be able to get that grip based on it being colder out. And Monty's talked about that before, how, how tough it is early in the season in those cold temperatures. And they've changed the rules where you used to have to leave the dirt portion of the mound to blow into your hand and you had to get permission from the umpires to blow into your hand and typically that would be on a cold night umpires before the first pitch the home plate umpire would blow into his hand and make sure both dugouts knew that it's okay to do it well now they allow the pitchers to do that whenever they want so that they don't have to leave the dirt portion of the mound blow into their hand come back on the mound but if a pitcher goes to his mouth he immediately has to dry that hand off on his pant leg or his jersey. If he goes from his mouth directly to the ball, then it's an automatic ball in the ball strike count. I can answer this one real quickly with two outs. Had a question from Scott. Where is Frenchie tonight? Head off Sunday, off today, and they're Really trying to give him some time off as he tries to work through some things. And I asked Ned Yost if we maybe see him back tomorrow or when, and he said day-to-day, so we shall see. 
Well, some of it might have to do with how well Lorenzo Kane plays in right field and Gerard Dyson in center. It's an opportunity to put Kane in right and take some strain off of his legs, less demanding in right than it is in center. Yeah, and Kane will have to get used to the different uh, angles that the ball will present in right field a lot. Right handed bats, the ball sails towards the line. So just getting used to a few different angles off the bat will be what the toughest job for Kane moving from center to right. The center field, the ball is true. It, it, it's, it's well struck most of the time and it doesn't have any spin on the ball to the right or to the left. Here's one for you, HUD, real quick. Keith Engelmeyer, is it generally easier for a right handed hitter to hit off a right handed pitcher than a left handed hitter to hit off a left handed pitcher? I'm going to say a right handed hitter to face a righty because you see more of them. More righties than, than lefties, so that's the only reason, but it's hard to hit the ball going away from you. If you have a chance and you got a young three, four year old kid, let him hit on both sides of the plate. Hopefully he'll take it and run with it. And Santana runs and Hafner pulls it hard but foul. Well, here's one. We talked about it a little bit the other day. Heath Mitts, Heath in Chicago. For the booth, does anyone keep track of the number of broken bats? If so, how big of a lead does Gordon have? We know Damon has a lot. Gordon has a lot. And I, I, I think that there's actually a, a bat company that keeps track of all this. But there aren't stats out there like we have so many of them that are readily available. We do know that Alex is up there in the top. I want to know how many broken bat hits he has in the last 10 days. Hafner strikes out again. Hochaver grinds through five innings. He has struck out six. He qualifies for the win. The Royals have an 8 3 lead. inning for the Royals are AT&T U-verse reverse replays. Now Lowe didn't mean to balk but that sure helped and Chris gets he answered him with a nice two run double knocked in a couple Gordon got one over the leaping Kochman to first base for another double for him at Escobar it continues to rake third RBI on the night and his fifth triple five runs in the third inning that's a welcome sight to a team that's been run deprived. It's just the second five run inning of the month. Royals had a five run inning in early July at Toronto. Osmer walked and scored in that five run third and he's grounded back to the mound grounded back to the pitcher. Now facing Tomlin. That'll slice back into the seats. One ball two strikes. Royals have scored in three of the four innings tonight. 
One in the first. Kane driving in a run. Two in the second. Escobar driving in two. And then the five run third we just showed you. Tomlin got the Royals in order in the fourth. Kochman, who has the major league record for consecutive errorless games at first, takes care of Hosmer one away. Twitter Tuesday. Let's bring Joel Goldberg back in. Well, here's one uh, wanting to know. We just saw Duffy in the Royals dugout. Where is Soria? I'm not. You know, we haven't heard a lot on Soria. I believe he's out rehabbing in Arizona. Is that correct? That's what I've heard. Yeah, and that's where his family is. And also, his situation is interesting because. You know, he is up after this year, although there is a very large option contractually for next year, dollar figure wise, and wouldn't seem like that would be something the Royals would pick up, but it's possible they could renegotiate something and, and have him for mm -hmm. yeah. next year and maybe beyond. And when you're a single guy like Duffy, he can, you know, come on out and hang out with the guys, but when you have kids and stuff, it's a little different ball game. So if you have a chance to go rehab in a, your own hometown, that's what he's doing. Felipe Paulino the same. Lives in Houston with his family. I think I got a yoga question for you, Rex. Uh oh, I don't really know. Do you do that, Ryan? He's the he's the guy to ask. Do you do that, Ryan? Uh, yeah, once every couple of years or so. <laughs> you beat me. What, what is Rex's favorite? I don't even know how to pronounce it. Bik Bikram, Bikram Asana. Yeah. Bikram. Bikram yoga right. is what I like to do. I'll, I'll, it's, 100, be, you know. it's 105 in the room, and it's 90 minutes. So you could go down in the field That's right now and do yoga if you wanted to. <laughs> 20, 26 uh, poses, basically. You're on a mat, and it's a great workout. I don't, it doesn't pound my, my knee, doesn't swell. It actually helps heal from the inside out. It's a very good practice. I, I like it. Sounds like a pregame show feature. <laughs> You know what we ought to do, Joel? We ought to get a round table discussion with Fizz. Hud and with Fizz. Fizz is a big yoga guy, too. I'll moderate it from the other side of the glass where it's air conditioned. <laughs> yeah. Hey, these, the challenge is just staying in the room. These guys from Southern California, I tell you. <laughs> man. Hey, now, look, I don't mind sharing <laughs> what I like to do off the field, but look, uh, it, it's a challenge. I'd like you only come with me one time on the road. They, they got them in every city we go to. I'll uh, I'll consider it, but I don't know a thing about that. I prefer a nice run in the hundred degree heat like I had today. Yeah. How about a nap when the room temperature is about sixty five degrees? <laughs> You're allowed to lay yeah. on your mat. You yeah. are, so you could do that. Hey Ryan, I don't know if we could ask Trevor Vance this or HUD, but. Is it bad if I got a text from home saying, good news is our lawn will be very green, bad news is I forgot the water was on for a huge long time? Ooh. For a huge long time? I don't know what that Which means. It's a lot worse than a long time. Yeah, we'll have to check on it's that. One, it's one thing to have your water on for a long time, but when it's on for a huge long time, ooh, how's the water yeah. bill here? <laughs> uh, it just went up at my house. Yeah. <laughs> Trevor Vance, your thoughts? He told us. Slice to left center. Brantley a long run. That's going to be another extra base hit for Dyson, and he's thinking three. Gerard Dyson tonight has a double and a triple. And the Royals already have one rally tonight with two outs and nobody on. And trying for another one in the fifth. All right. Seems like uh, Dyson's got a little second wind. Getting a chance to start here these last few days. He's saying, you know what? They gave me plenty of an opportunity before the All-Star break to play. And it wasn't exactly on my game, although it's starting to come. He's got 17 stolen bases. That's in the top 10. And now look at him go. He's got tremendous speed, and he, when he utilizes it, he's a threat. And he's a, a, a definite pressure builder for the defenses that try to defend him. And now Alex Gordon, who's perfect so far tonight. Singleton scored in the first, walked in the second. Had a hustling double in the third. Drove in a run and scored. Two runs scored and an RBI. Batting at 293.
One and one. A lot of folks wondering about who will replace Jonathan Broxton, not as the closer, but that 25th spot now that is open in the Royals saying they'll get somebody up here tomorrow, AAA Omaha at Oklahoma City tonight. So we will see on that one. All right, thank you, Joel. As Alex grounds out, running hard up the line, Dyson is left at third base. At the end of five, the Royals lead by five. right around the corner and that means it's time to help underprivileged kids in the Kansas City area on Thursday August 2nd and Friday August 3rd Royals Charities will be hosting a back to school drive here at Coffin Stadium and fans are encouraged to donate school supplies backpacks and cash and we if you bring in a backpack uh, make sure that it's it's a not a live animal for a backpack because we had a an incident before the game today is rookie pitcher Cody Allen and it's the the job of a, a rookie in the bullpen to carry all of the supplies out to the bullpen all the bubble gum all the sunflower seeds as Johnny Damon is thrown out by Chris Getz and there it is but that was a uh, a live Animal with a thick coat on a hot night and had some difficulty breathing out in the bullpen. And Cody Allen did everything he could to uh, revive the backpack, which had a difficult time. And sometimes there's just nothing you can do, and that's that. <laughs> so, anyway, please no live animal backpacks for the back to school drive. Look at all the flowers. Yep. Sunflower seeds, bubble gum, a baseball. Jeff Montgomery's here in the booth. Pretty good segue. And uh, Monty's here to talk about the departure of Jonathan Broxton. And Greg Holland will be getting his first shot to be a big league closer. Ned Yost made that official that the Royals aren't going to try a closer by committee. They are going to hand it over to Greg Holland for the time being. During our radio roundtable today, you... Uh, made an interesting point about uh, you know the difference between Holland just being given the ninth inning or maybe from time to time getting a four or five out save. Well he's certainly a guy that is going out you know, over the last two seasons and done a really nice job on bailing Royals pitchers out of jams. Essentially coming in with guys on base sometimes bases loaded no out one out putting out the fire and then going out the next inning and being very effective but the way the closers' roles evolved over the last decade plus, now closers are ninth inning guys only. But I think it's a real luxury when you have a guy that has the ability that a Greg Holland has to, to really put out those fires. Uh, think of Dan Quisenberry, all the saves he got. A lot of his saves were more than ninth inning saves. They were 
probably coming in in the sixth and seventh inning and getting an out or two to put out the fire then finish the game off and it just has really transitioned a lot uh, from back in those days of the early and mid 80s to where the game is now with the regard to the closer and you were saying that you would prefer going back to being a young closer to maybe closing out the eighth and then rolling over into the ninth well I really did and one reason is that you create more opportunities because a lot of times the, the, the save comes in the eighth inning mm -hmm. the jam is in the eighth inning if you don't get out of that eighth inning there's not gonna be an opportunity to pitch in the ninth inning so that's why a lot of times it was great to have that opportunity nice play by Alex into the corner right before he slams into the wall wow I'll say full speed Good focus. Makes the catch. Okay, Alex Gordon, he won the gold glove last year because that guy is an athlete and he's not afraid to lay his body on the line. He can run and he can catch and he can crash. He knows how to do it. He turned his back to the wall. If he goes in with his shoulder, he's got a shoulder surgery right there happening. That, that's full speed, but he turned his back just in time, stayed away from it, and the fans love him. And that means that Luke Kochaver gets through. Six innings tonight. Jeff Montgomery is here in the booth, and we we're talking about Jonathan Broxton. We we're talking about Greg Holland and uh, Luke tonight. He had his moments where he was dominant with his curveball, but he's able to get through six innings. Some balls were hard hit, but maybe not without his A game. Still able to get through. Six. Able to stay in the game. I thought the key was being able to really locate that breaking ball in some big situations, getting out of some jams. Had to one little mental lapse when he didn't cover first base. I was afraid that may come back to haunt him when Johnny Damon hit the ground ball earlier in the game. I guess in the second inning. So, but he recovered and again kept battling, stayed in the game. And I bring that up because Tim Collins is warming up in the bullpen. So it looks like he will take over in the seventh inning. Our Sonic Slam inning contestant is Craig Miller from Kearney. And if the Royals hit a home run in this inning, Craig wins $4,100. That would be Kearney, Missouri. If the Royals hit a grand slam out of the park, Craig wins 25 grand from Sonic. And the Kansas City Royals. The Cleveland Indians, by the way, have not allowed a grand slam all season long. Escobar, Kane, and Butler coming up against Tomlin. One ball, two strikes on Escobar. Monty, last inning you were talking about Holland and, and the fact that Ned came out and, and made him the starter that Broxton's been traded today. Talk about what it's like down in the bullpen when it's a closer by committee and you're not sure who the closer is. Well, pitching in various roles is seemingly different because, like, I know as a closer, you're going to pitch to the situation. Not that you don't in any role that you have, but as a closer, you're coming, you know there's a finite amount of outs that you got to get. So you're going to really, again, pitch to that situation. 
it may mean that you're going to pitch away more. You don't want, you know, you want to keep the ball in the ballpark. You don't have to set up hitters for later in the game. So you're going to give it everything you have during that that one inning or that one inning plus. And that's one thing that you know, we've seen from Greg Holland. He's a max effort guy. He comes in and he's got great stuff. Has everything I like about him. Everything is down in the strike zone. Fastball, good good life to it. It's down. It's splitters down. It's sliders down. Just really at, at times unhittable. So then Kelvin Herrera. Say Ned didn't didn't give a starter. So now what's Kelvin thinking if 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 it's a starter by I mean a closer by committee? Well, you know, I, I, I was a role player as a bench player, and I I like to know my role where I was going if I was going to get the lefties if other guys got righties you know who they were hitting where it just seemed like it would be a little bit confusing out there when you, everybody was wait, watching for the phone to ring well when you when you know what innings to be ready you're you're going to really kind of focus in on those innings you're going to be uh, mentally you're going to be ready to go you're on call you're exactly ready as soon as that phone rings you know it's going to be you and if there's a little disarray there's uncertainty on the rolls and who's going to pitch in certain times of the game oftentimes you don't you, you're not as effective because you don't prepare to say that's a good point too because the question comes up from time to time well what does it matter if he's coming in the sixth inning or the seventh inning or the eighth inning I mean no matter what inning you come in just come in and do the job but you're saying there's a there's a mental preparation that goes with the physical preparation it, it is very difficult to sit in the bullpen for nine innings and be on the edge for that whole nine innings of the game but if you know that you're going to pitch likely in the in the seventh eighth or ninth inning you can not necessarily relax, but you can allow yourself to kind of just get ready for that time. And then when that time comes, then the adrenaline starts to flow. Then you start getting your mindset on ready to go in and get that first guy you face out. Okay, that's what I was trying to get out of you. That's exactly what I was thinking. By committee, everybody's out there wondering. But when you're in, when you're slotted in your spots, everyone knows, and it, it makes for better uh, mental adjustment in the game. We all know. Revolves around the delicate mental muscle, right? It's 90% mental, 50% physical, right? That's what I say. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, that hurt on the forearm, or maybe on the inside part of the elbow by Santana. So what you're saying, Monty, is if, if a pitcher who's out in the bullpen now, and let's say he's a, uh, he's not the setup man, or he's not the closer, or today, I mean, you've got a setup man to the setup man, and then the closer. So you. On a good team, you've got your your seventh inning guy identified. You got your eighth inning guy identified, and then your closer. So if it's a close game, the guys that aren't in those roles, they're pretty intense for the first six, maybe seven innings. But they know after a while that their opportunity to come in the game is going to be passed up, and they don't have to be on edge all night. The bat went flying into the seats, and. I believe everybody is all right as Lorenzo Kane reaches with an infield single. Boy, that was scary. That bat with a lot of velocity went flying into the seats behind the third base dugout. Looks like everyone's okay. They're just trying to figure out who owns it now. But this bat, I mean, was sawed off. And see, when a hitter follows through and the head of the bat gets elevated, it lands in the stands. Everybody's happy. They're smiling. And there's a new owner. To the broken bat. And now Billy, he's one for three where the run scored. So around your point again, you just if you're if you're sitting on the, in the bullpen on edge all night, mentally you're gonna be exhausted by the time it's you know your time to, to pitch in the game. So this allows everyone to really again just be you know really in kind of soft focus until their their part of the game rolls around. Lorenzo Kane just beating a good throw from Santana who threw from his knees and it looked really close. Pulls a little trick out of Salvador's Perez's bag of tricks. One hopper two. Kipnis with a good pick. Kipnis thought he got it. Let's see a closer look at it. Oh, I, th I thought it was awfully close. Kane, he clapped and said, Ooh, thank you. I'll take the safe call. So it really is a stolen base. <laughs> he ripped him off because it looked like he tagged him on that last little slow motion we saw there. It looked like he got it. Kipnis, good pick and tag. Now, Monty, we've been spoiled the past few years because Joaquin Soria would come out of the bullpen, those flames 
would circle the ballpark and the game was over just about every night. I mean, oftentimes three up, three down. Wasn't the same for Broxton, but I was impressed how many first and thirds, one out he got out of, second and third, one out. I mean, I would think the younger guys had something to learn from him, even though he didn't have a clean save every time. And I agree. There were a lot of situations, first and second, nobody out, one run game. He was able to wiggle out of it. Joaquin Soria was a cool, collected guy on the mound. We saw that from Broxton, but we didn't see the smooth outs that we saw from Soria. Kane goes to third on the fly ball from Butler. Yeah, he was. I mean, he was 23 out of 26. And there was some good fortune mixed in, which is the case for every closer. But that, I believe, was the sixth highest save total of any closer in the American League. And he's going to the Reds, who have Ardola Chapman, who he actually has a better save percentage than Chapman does. So he got a pretty good situation out in Cincinnati. Now, you never went from... I believe you never went from all star closer to setup man. You were just always a closer once you got that role. So yes. what kind of adjustments is Brock? I mean, he's going to lose the adrenaline in the ninth inning. You think it'll be tough for him to work the eighth? I think he'll be just fine. I know that the, that situation brings out the best in a lot of guys. I know it does from Jonathan, for Jonathan Brock. I talked to him a little bit after spring training camp because in spring training I saw his velocity range you in the low 90s. And then we got in some safe situations here. He's eventually getting it back up to that 97 98 range that we expected he said that was because of the adrenaline that the safe situation created for him. One and two on Moustakis who's 0 for 3 batting with Kane at third and two down. I'm sure the Reds closer Chapman has been running on some fumes lately too even though he, he doesn't always show it. I'm sure that Dusty Baker wouldn't have made that such a big deal had his closer been 100% healthy as you never know. Well, you see how many guys that, that throw 100 miles an hour now are breaking down, blowing out that ligament like you mentioned earlier, Rex. So it's always good to have a guy like Brox who's proven he's having a good season. Uh, you've got that security blanket now because the Reds have really turned themselves into one of the top teams in the uh, National League. 20 games over 500. Broxton has experienced the, the pressure late in the season. With a team in contention as a closer, Chapman has not. And the intensity of the season is going to change in the month of August, and it's certainly going to change in September. And you don't know what anyone's going to do when they're put in new situations. We're talking about Greg Holland. It'll be interesting to see how he responds to his opportunity. I think it's a great opportunity for him. I think he'll respond just great. We saw a little bit of that last year when Joaquin Sorry was down toward the end of the season when Holland came in and did uh, such a nice job in that role. Fouled off the third. Hanahan makes the play. The Royals are scoreless in the sixth. To the seventh. Game one of a six game homestand off to a good start. The Royals lead by five. Royals baseball is brought to you by Panera Bread. Now with 24 KC Metro locations, visit us online at PaneraKansas.com. 
And by AT&T U-verse, the new wireless receiver from AT&T U-verse. Visit att.com slash free your TV. Rethink possible. Tim Collins will take over as we head to the seventh inning. The Royals lead 8-3. They have a five-run third inning tonight. Scored in each of the first three innings. Scoreless in the last three. In fact, neither the Royals or the Indians have scored in the last three innings. So it was 8-3 at the end of three. And now Collins, after six innings from Luke Hochaver, Hochaver came out and struck out six tonight, five of those in the first two innings. And there was some hard hit outs later in the game, but Hochaver finished with three scoreless and is in line to win his seventh game of the year. And Collins will get the top of the order. Shin Su Chu has Drupal Cabrera and Jason Kipnis. And as Rex pointed out in between innings, key for Ho Chaver tonight, HUD, was keeping the Indians in the ballpark. Kept them in the yard. A couple of them got close to leaving, but they made the catch all but one. And I believe that was a winner in the hot watch. Yep. Is that what you took? That was what I took. I was hoping I had some company with me. Stay hot. Would you take money? I'm still looking for Moose to drive in a run. run. Shin Su Chu has been so tough on the Royals over the years. He's 0 for 3 with three strikeouts. So a good start for Tim Collins. One down. We've been talking about Jonathan Broxson's trade to the Reds. Greg Holland is now the Royals closer. And here's what Royals manager Ned Yost had to say before the game. It's tough, one, but it's also his ability to compete on the mound, his ability to, to, to stay composed in tough situations and make quality pitches when you need to. And those are all things that um, I think he does. And that was in reference to Greg Holland and the decision to turn to him, which I think most people would agree with. But if Ned wanted to give some save opportunities to Aaron Crow and to Kelvin Herrera, and maybe even Tim Collins. I mean, the Royals are pretty solid with those four. What for you stands out for Greg Holland compared to the other three? I think the level of confidence and what we saw from a consistency standpoint both last year and what we've seen from him since his return from the disabled list earlier this year. It's amazing that he has four pitches and he says he uses all of them depending on the situation and what it is and you know his split finger. It's a it's a pitch that that, that go, has a good downward angle to it, and so does his slider and his curveball. They're, they're they're all similar. It's hard to tell which one's which. I tell you, just watching him, either either on TV on the monitor or in person, I can't tell which pitch is which. Mm -hmm. To be honest, I mean his arm speed is great on all of them. The the downward tilt on all of them. I think it's just having the ability to throw just one of them for strikes. It's great, but when you can mix all three of those in for strikes with that fastball in the mid 90s, it makes him a very very quality guy. He had the hitters fooled last year and he had us fooled because how many times do you say hey got him with a slider and then we'd watch the replay and it was a splitter yep. vice versa <laughs> Ooh, good splitter. Yeah and I, I asked him about that earlier in the year and he goes yeah a lot of people have a hard time telling as long as that hitter don't know I'm happy. That's right. Well I think a lot of that too just is the fact that some nights he may feel better about throwing the splitter than he does the slider. Base hit for Cabrera, his second. One on one out in the seventh. All right. Any fastball at any velocity can be hit if it's out over the plate. That's where that one was. Now there's a lot more on the line when you're pitching the ninth inning as opposed to the eighth inning. I mean you're the you're the anchor of the bullpen you're the the last hope to close the game out so there's the obvious difference when it comes to pressure for Greg Holland but what else is he going to have to be prepared for in the ninth that maybe he didn't have to prepare for in the eighth something less obvious well the thing that I always felt as a as a closer there's not a safety net you're on the high wire and there's no safety net you fall it's over whereas as you when you come in in the seventh inning or eighth inning, you've always got that anchor, like you mentioned, behind you. Now, 
the difference in the pitching the ninth inning is you will see the very best three batters that the opposing team has. And it may be the three, four, or five guys coming up in the lineup. If it's not, it's going to be the best two or three guys off the bench, like a Rex Hudler coming off to get a big hit late in the game with guys on base. And I, Which team was that one? <laughs> I want to know. <laughs> <laughs> it, it seemed like Harold Baines was always that guy for me. Mm. If we were playing a team, whether it be the, the White Sox or the the Athletics or the Orioles that he was on, if he didn't play in that game, he would always come up to bat in the ninth inning. He would wear me out. For some reason, he was always that guy that I was always hopeful he was in the lineup. So that way I could kind of orchestrate my work based on where he stood in the lineup. So you knew you would st- you would look at the lineup before the game or in the middle of the game? In the middle of the game, sixth inning, seventh inning, you kind of start playing the game through in your mind thinking, gosh, if I come out in the ninth inning, I'm probably going to see these guys and after a while, you got pretty good at predicting how it's going to be because if the, if the situation changed, then you were not going to face anybody because the game was either going to be over or you didn't have a lead. And on the other hand, a championship team has two really good hitters, power hitters, either a right-hander or a left-hander. You, you have one to complement the other. So when he brings in a righty, you say, uh-oh, uh, I gotta, he's got this left-hander over here. I can't bring that righty in. He's too good. Let me go to the lefty. Oh, they have this other guy. So it's all mix and match at the end of the game facing a closer. Kipnis walks, so two on with one out. I would also think, Monty, that while there's more pressure in the ninth inning, that Greg Holland doesn't want to think about that and think about he has to do something greater now in the ninth than he did when he was pitching the eighth. And I think that's one reason that Ned Yost has identified him as a guy. He's experienced enough now that he understands exactly what it is that his job is going to be, and he's not going to try to put more pressure on himself now that he's pitching the the last out in the eighth or the three outs in the ninth as opposed to coming in maybe in the seventh inning uh, to get a couple of outs or a situation that uh, he has to get out of an inning. Michael Brantley is two out of three tonight with a run scored and an excellent play in center field. And he lined into a double play in the fifth inning and that was a big play for Luke Hochaver and the Royals. Kipnis had singled. And Brantley hit a shot right to Eric Hosmer who went to the bag. He doubled off Kipnis. Ochaver got through that inning and then finished by retiring the Indians in order in the sixth. Yeah, I agree. That seemed to be a real pick-me-up for Luke Ochaver when uh, Hosmer snagged the line drive. Well, you know, that's only right. You know, Hoch has done a pretty good job coming in, stopping losing streaks. You know, it's nice that somebody picks him up. Mm-hmm. And Hosmer could have picked a more talented guy to hit it at. Chance for two gets Escobar Hosmer inning over. Thank you, Monty. Stretch time at Kauffman Stadium. Royals lead 8 3. by the Missouri Division of Tourism. Go to visitmo.com to start planning your next Missouri getaway. This is the current river near Salem, stretching a total of 89 miles, starting at Montauk State Park in Dent County and going southeast through the state. Canoe, kayak, inner tube, and small raft floats are available for rental to float down the current river. The site is located in the Ozark 
National Scenic Riverways, 21 miles south of Salem. That looks refreshing. Mm -hmm. Well, this looks refreshing. The Royals with a five run lead into the bottom of the seventh inning. Royals scoring all eight runs in the first three. Luke Kochaver with a quality start. Giving up three runs, seven hits in his six innings. He also struck out six. And the second inning for Jeremy Accardo as he gets Salvador Perez, Eric Hosmer, and Chris Getz. Sal one for three. He singled and scored in the Royals five run third. And Perez had a little bit of a break during the road trip. He played in five of the seven games. So two games off. Recharging before coming back to the extreme heat in the Midwest. Royals have three against Cleveland. Followed by three against the Texas Rangers. All three games with the Indians will be night games. Tonight, tomorrow night, and Thursday night. One ball, two strikes. Cardo, 91 to 94 mile an hour sinking fastball. Slider and a split finger. He'll give you something to hit. That's his second strikeout. So Perez is down to begin the seventh inning. Jeremy Accardo, one of those players that wasn't drafted. He was signed by the Giants after the draft in 2003. Out of Illinois State where he was a closer and a shortstop. And we're going to see more. Undrafted free agents making it to the big leagues as with the new collective bargaining agreement no longer are the teams drafting for 50 rounds now 40 rounds. But still the need to fill up those minor league rosters. So that won't be as. In my opinion as much of an oddity in the years to come. No you're right. Some good players out there that don't get drafted. In fact both pitchers in the game right now fall into that category. Ricardo and the Royals Tim Collins. Osmer pounds it to center field. Didn't get it on the fat part of the bat. So Brantley makes the play. Hosmer is 0 for 3. Two down in the seventh. Well, remember, if you're out of town, you can take the Royals with you if you subscribe to MLB.tv. You'll see every Royals out of market game live online. And on your favorite devices in HD quality. Just visit Royals.com to order. MLB.tv. Baseball everywhere. Chris Getz has two hits, two runs scored, and two driven in. Royals scored seven runs off of Indian starter Derek Lowe in just two and a third. They got one off of Josh Tomlin. We went two and two thirds. Getz had a rough trip through Anaheim and Seattle, just two out of 14, but off to a very good start on the homestand. Three and one. And diving play by Kipnis. In oh. time to get Chris Getz, who thought he was safe. So Getz every now and then will take a hit away just like that. He gets a taste of his own medicine. Royals are down in the seventh.
It's Miller time. Brought to you by Miller Lite. And Luke Kochaver getting the Royals off to a good start at the beginning of this homestand with six innings. He had to grind through a few innings, but grind through it he did. Getting the game into the seventh. He's in position to win his seventh game of the year. And good for him in the way he has bounced back against the Indians. Remember that game here at Kauffman Stadium for the home opener. But now Luke in his last two starts against Cleveland has gone 12 and a third innings and allowing just five earned runs. Tim Collins took over in the seventh, worked around a single and a walk. And now we'll get Santana, Hafner, and Damon in the eighth. And Santana jumps on the first pitch. Perez runs to the screen, but it just drops on the other side. Santana doubled and scored and the Indians two run second inning. That was the last time Cleveland had the lead. There's a lot of scoring in the first three innings and now nobody has scored since the Royals got five in the bottom of the third. One and one. Royals got a run in the bottom of the first Cleveland two in the second the Royals two in the second Cleveland one in the third the Royals five in the third and Rex mentioned earlier that the Royals first three home games this year were against the Cleveland Indians and they swept that series and the Royals went on to lose ten in a row at home but then the Royals have really bounced back nicely against Cleveland after losing their first four to the Indians, now they've won four out of five. And a couple of winning series in Cleveland. Escobar gets Santana, but the throw is wild. Santana may have made a move towards second base. He is out. Yes, he did. The Royals were all over that. Well, when you're a runner and you know you made a little left turn on that left side of that foul line. You need to hustle back to first base. Hey, that throw just a little bit. See how he started moving towards second. And now look at look at the first base coach. He's telling him, hey, you better go back and touch first. It's Tom Wiedenbauer, first base coach, saying, hey, you better get back there. And he showed no urgency to, and he's out. We'll wait and see how they score it. It is going to be an error on Escobar, allowing Santana to reach. And then Santana's out three unassisted. Jose Lopez is pinch hitting for Travis Hafner, who is 0 for 3 with a couple of strikeouts. It's an unfortunate error for Escobar. We always see him put that ball right on the money. Hosmer tried to keep his foot on the base. Be his 11th there. Two and one. Left center field Alex Gordon is there and there are two down in the eighth inning. <laughs> Cleveland Indians have two hits since scoring their last run in the third inning. Here's tonight's AT&T trivia question. Who is the only pitcher to start 400 or more games and appear in 400 or more as a reliever. Do we have a. A date? Or are we going 126 years in baseball? I would think the Indians starting pitcher tonight, Derek Lowe, would have been a candidate. He spent some time as a closer with the Boston Red Sox. Come on, Dennis Eckersley. We are wrong. 
on both accounts. Derek Lowe is the eighth pitcher in Major League history with 150 wins. He has 174 now and at least 50 saves. He has 85 of those. Four hundred starts, four hundred appearances out of the bullpen. What about John Smoltz? How long was he a closer? Was he a closer long enough to have four hundred games out of the bullpen? That's a good guess. Okay, we've been given a clue. The time span would be between 1970 and 1994. So did that player pitched that long. That's 25 years. 25 seasons. He's not a Hall of Famer. That's why I thought Eckersley might match it. Three balls and two strikes on Johnny Damon. I can tell you that Johnny Damon is the 11th player. In Major League history with at least 500 doubles. 100 triples. 200 home runs. And 2500 hits. Wow. He, Al might have stumped me tonight. I don't know if I have another one for that. See those nice, beautiful royal shirts that were given away before the game tonight? T shirt Monday. Or Tuesday. That's right. <laughs> it was an off day yesterday. Yeah, T shirt Monday was yesterday. <laughs> My bad. It's a good one. Gets plays it on a short hop. Tim Collins has two scoreless innings to the bottom of the eighth. Royals are still on top by five. Eight three Royals over the Indians here at Kauffman Stadium. Panera takes us around the American League. Baltimore eleven to five over New York. Josh Beckett gets rocked 
leaves with back spasms in that one, so not around very long. Texas losing to Los Angeles as the Angels keep trying to make up ground. Francisco Liriano getting the start against his old team and pitches well. Did have four walks, but an effective start for him. Tampa and Oakland, Toronto and Seattle are coming up, or just, I should say, underway. A couple other things worth pointing out, guys. Omaha, after going down 5 nothing, put up a pair of five spots and then a two-run eighth. They're up 12-5, to and Will Myers again with a home run after two yesterday. That's four in four games. He had been ice cold, but seems to be out of that slump. Guys? Well, and every player is going to have one of those streaks during the season, Will Myers. And you wonder if he might have been beaten down a little bit by the Futures game and then the AAA All-Star game and all the travel and the whirlwind associated with that. Might have taken him a week or two after that to get his feet underneath him again. Very possible. Even without all that, it's not unheard of for a guy to shut down for a week or two. Joe Smith is the fourth Indians pitcher tonight. And Dyson goes up the middle for a base hit. He's a home run shy of hitting for the cycle. And Gerard has just one major league home run. But a double in the second inning, a triple in the fifth, and now a single in the eighth. Okay, it, it jammed him, but he's able to keep his hands inside the ball. Kept him in there, and it was able to guide it up the middle. And the one out that he made tonight was a fly ball to deep right field on the warning track. So he almost went deep. Fifth time in Gerard Dyson's career that he's had a three hit game and three of those have come this season. And he's getting a chance to play even though he's in center field. He's in there because Jeff Francoeur is getting a physical and a mental break. So with Francoeur out Lorenzo Kane slides over to right and that opens up center field for Dyson. Francoeur not in the lineup on Sunday. Yesterday was a scheduled off day. Out of the lineup tonight. What is gained? Because there, there are benefits of just sitting and watching the game for a couple of days. What's gained? What's gained for Frank Hoor is the opportunity for him to pull for his teammates, to give a different side, to give him a little break, like you said, physically and mentally, to detox from not having to play, the pressure when you're slumping. So to, to gain is more mental than physical. And because he doesn't have to take the field, he's right there in the first base dugout all night. He can watch every hitter take the take the red bat tonight. And sometimes you pick something up just by watching another hitter. Alex. That's not a broken bat base hit. That's off the fence in right field. He's into second base with another double. Dyson will hold to third. And Alex Gordon has a three hit game. He has two doubles tonight and now his league leading total is 36. Man, and he got the head out there. That's inside part of the plate quickness in there. He wasn't trying to push that ball to the opposite field. He got the head out. So what I say when whenever a guy pulls the ball he gets the barrel in the head of the bat there. And no doubter. Escobar's already had a good night as a chance to have a really good night. And the Indians bring the infield in Hanahan fields in fair ground. He gets Escobar who has driven in three and not what Alcides had in mind. And there's one down in the eighth. After exhaustive research, Rex Hudler has come up with the answer to our AT&T trivia question. The only pitcher to start 400 or more games and appear in 400 or more as a reliever is Charlie Huff. 
knuckleballer, rubber arm, gamer, great guy too. Just foul off to the third base side, up the bat of Lorenzo Cain. How old was he? See if you can look this up. How old was he when he made his final appearance? I mean, he hung around for a long time. I think he ended his career with the Florida Marlins, I want to say. I mean, late 40s at least. 45. That's it? It was 45 years wow. old. I would have said 47. 0 oh, and 2 on Kane. Two hits and an RBI tonight. And now Kane strikes out, two down in the eighth. And now the truck is saying it was 46. He was 46 when he made his last appearance. Good enough for me. It's <laughs> pretty good. A little career. fuzzy math, was it? Well, you know, it said here uh, he was nearly 43 years old. Huff was granted free agent status after the 90 season. He played two more years. So. Okay. So 43 plus two. I thought would usually is 55 or 45. <laughs> Hello. <clears throat> Billy one for four. He was part of the five run third inning. He is hit in six in a row. He is the American League's player of the week. The fourth time in his career he's done that. And the Royals have runners at second and third with nobody out in the eighth inning. But that doesn't sting as much as they take a five run lead into the ninth inning. Stadium, Joel Goldberg, Jeff Montgomery getting ready for Boulevard Royals Live. We'll be talking about the Royals offense exploding and finally getting some runs on the board. Luke Hochaver able to battle through some rough stretches and get a quality start here. We'll have that highlights reaction and get you ready for tomorrow's matchup of McAllister and Mendoza coming up on Boulevard Royals Live. And interesting what's going on in Arlington because the Rangers with that big lead seeing it start to dwindle away a little bit Albert Pujols a pair of home runs he is now at 20 so much for that slow start and the Rangers just three games out in the American League West they come or ahead in the American League West and the Angels making it very very interesting that's going to be a race worth watching all the way down to the end guys all right Joel so at the moment the Angels are in second place three games out Aaron Crow will pitch the ninth here for the Royals and Oakland they are at home 
hosting Tampa Bay. They're just in the top of the third inning. Tampa Bay leads 2 0. Albert Pujols sure likes to hit in Texas, doesn't he? Ooh, yeah. The game he had in the World Series last year. One ball and two strikes on Casey Kochman. One for two with a walk and an RBI. And a good start for Aaron Crow. One down in the ninth. There's not many hitters that can hit that slider, right, left handers or right handers, if it's thrown exactly where he wants it. And this is where he puts it. On lefties and righties. It's just a good hard downward break. Hard to pick up that pitch from the 95 on our fastball he throws. Same arm speed. I just looked it up. It was game two of the World Series last year. Albert Pujols in Texas. Three home runs. Tying the Major League. World Series record set by Babe Ruth. Six RBIs. That tied a World Series record. Five hits. All in one game against the Rangers. Mm. But that was game two. Game two would have been in St. Louis. Because the World Series finished. In St. Louis. Started in St. Louis. Finished in St. Louis. That's something that comes up quite a bit when. The debate. Rages over the benefits of the All Star game, deciding home field advantage. The Cardinals win the World Series in 2011 without that home field advantage. As Hanahan walks with one out. He's on base for the first time. They'll have it again this year, too. All-star game here at the cave. Didn't get off the way Verlander thought it was going to get off as they scored what, five in the first off of him. It was over after that. And speaking of Justin Verlander. Two series ago the Cleveland Indians beat Justin Verlander and they were down late. They were down 3 1 in the seventh inning. And the Indians hit a couple of home runs to tie the game. They eventually beat Justin Verlander. They took two out of three from the Tigers and trying to hang on to contention in the Central Division. But then from there, over the weekend, while the Royals were in Seattle, Cleveland was in Minnesota. And they were swept in a three game series where they were outscored 28 6. Mm. Four strikeouts, a golden sombrero for Shin Su Chu. A 356 career hitter at Pompin Stadium tonight. Goal for four, four strikeouts and a walk. Hey, that's a fastball right down the middle. Just for clarification, I looked it up again. That was game three for Pooh Holes in the World Series, so it was Texas. at Texas. Now I'll be able to sleep tonight. Oh, you were right. I remember that game. Right. One ball, one strike on Asdrubal Cabrera. Take second base. It's tough for any team to score more than eight runs. So the Indians had their hands full tonight with the Royals leading 8 3. But the two Indians who have been the hardest on the Royals this year, Shin Su Chu and Jason Kipnis, want to combine one for seven with a single. 
They both had seven RBIs against the Royals in the first three series played between the two teams this year. So they were quiet. Cabrera at the plate, two hits and a run scored. So the top three hitters, Chu, Cabrera, and Kipnis, were without an RBI, and so far all they've done is score one run. Just inside. So Aaron Crow, he's he's coming out saying, you know what? I think I want to show them that I have closer material. He's coming right out throwing strikes. Fastball slider. <laughs> On the ground to Getz, who had a big game tonight. The Royals have a big game. So they brush aside that disappointing road trip. And they begin a six game homestand with a big night on offense. Royals coming up with eight runs tonight on 14 hits. They get a good start from Luke Hochaver, who allows just three runs in six innings. And the Royals get three scoreless innings from the bullpen. And now the Royals have won five of their last six games against the Cleveland Indians after losing their first four against them this year. And the Indians dropped to three games below 500 for the first time since they started the year one and four. Good for the Royals to get off on the right foot here on the six game homestand. Several Royals had big nights tonight. Alex Gordon was one of them and he's down on the field with Joel. All right, Ryan, thank you very much. You're right. A lot of production throughout the lineup, and Alex has always helping lead things off here. First off, beyond the obvious of scoring a lot of runs, how important, just from a mental standpoint for this team, to have the third inning like you did? Yeah, it was big. You know, we had a pretty rough road trip, so to come home and, uh, you know, see the fans come out the way they did and uh, cheer us on was, was big for us. So we appreciate that, and, uh, you know, it was good to get a good win. Hopefully we can get things going. What about the mindset of this team, too? I know you guys have not given up, will not give up, but just the ability to maybe string some wins together and get things going in the right direction. Yeah, well, it's a start right now, so it's, uh, it's a tough game, but sometimes you just got to grind through, and that's what we're doing, we're trying to get better, you know, going out here trying every day to win a game. So uh, that's our approach right now, and uh, we're not giving up. What would you see from Hochaver tonight? Uh, he was great stuff. Uh, you know, he's got a tough lineup with all lefties and, you know, being a righty pitcher, so... Uh, had a couple strikeouts early on and uh, kept them kept them at bay for us and our offense was able to pick them up. I know all of you in the outfield like to make that big play whether it's the assist or the diving catch but how about slamming into the, the sidewall there take us through that play. Yeah it's always fun I thought it was a lot closer than I was so it, it didn't hurt that bad. Uh, I just laid there for a little bit to make make it look like it did but uh, that's our job is to go out there and play defense uh, for our pitchers and that's what we did. A great catch and embellished a little bit great job tonight. Yeah thank you. That is Alex Gordon. Why not, Ryan Wright? I mean, make a great catch and lay there for a little bit. Back upstairs <laughs> to you. Just to catch your breath on a hot night in Kansas City, but Alex was all over the place on the bases and in left field as the Royals take game one from the Indians. We'll be right back. <laughs> 